Hello, and welcome everyone to Influential Minds, an EEI International Conversation Series. My name is Erin Brogan, and I am the Manager of Marketing and Events for International Programs at EEI. Influential Minds is our virtual conversation series, which aims to discuss ideas that move the needle towards a more sustainable future with thought leaders from across the globe. Today, EEI International Programs is excited to welcome Ari Wallach, a futurist and social systems strategist. He joins us today to discuss his book, Long Path, Becoming the Great Ancestors, Our Future Needs, where he will discuss how to cultivate future conscious behavior and move toward long-term thinking. He, be, he will be joined in conversation by our host, EEI Vice President for International Programs, Dr. Lawrence Jones. Throughout the session, please feel free to ask questions using the chat feature. Dr. Jones will aim to incorporate as many of them as possible into the conversation. Without further ado, I will turn, the, turn this over to Lawrence to get started. Good morning, Ari, how are you doing? Good morning, great, how are you doing? Fine, welcome to EI National Programs and the Influential Minds, uh, we're glad to have you. I am very excited for this conversation. I've been, I've been looking forward to it for a while now, actually. Well, good. Well, let's begin by first of all saying congratulations on the book. Thank you. Uh, on path, doing it, becoming the great ancestors, our future needs. And I'll also go ahead and congratulate you for the 2.5 million views of your TED Talk conversation on Long Path. Thank you. Good. Well, let's jump straight into it, Ari. Uh, first of all, tell us, why did you write the book? And I talked about your 2.5 million views of your TED Talk. Was the book written before or after the TED Talk? So it's interesting. The, the, the book actually started being written in a kind of outline form about 20 years ago, which I know sounds like a very long time to write a book, but about 20 years ago, I was actually... was whenever I was kind of doing research for the conflict in that region, what, what kept happening was I kept seeing um, historical research that only went back maybe 15, 20, 30, 50 years. And I kept trying to figure out, well, I, I want to I put think about the conflict in a much grander time scale. I want to go back 500 years, 1,000 years. And there was just kind of an absence of the literature. So that's what actually got the kind of wheels turning in terms of if we want to think about how do we move forward, we have to obviously think about how we got to the present moment. Um, so that's kind of when it started. And then what ended up happening was I, I gave the TED Talk and the response was actually much stronger than I anticipated. And a bunch of folks came forward and said, this is great. It's a, you know, it's a great 16 minute TED Talk, but can you go deeper? Can you go further into these ideas? And that became what is the book that you now have in front of you. Interesting. So you call the book Long Path. Why that title? What is a long path? Or what is well, the long path? You know, it's, part of it is, is a recognition that when any, and because I wanted to write, first of all, I wanted to come up with, with a title that represented not just a noun, but actually a form of kind of action, if you will. So if we think, you know, there, there are books on, you know, we have to take the long view, right? And what that, what that does is, or, or let's say long term, and what that does, it really situates the individual in the present and asks them to kind of look out into the future. And having been a futurist for 20 plus years now, I can tell you that it's never a straight arrow. It's never between here and today. That's where we get caught when we try to take the present and extrapolate it out into the future. The reality is we actually have to wander. We actually are on a path. It's very much a journey to get to these futures that we want. So, so the term is meant to kind of take us away from this noun, right? And make it actually more of an active verb. Uh, I, I say in the book, the future is not a noun, the future is a verb. It's something that we actively do. And anyone who's ever gone on a hike or anything like that knows that you know it, it's, a, it's a journey. So long path is about rec a recognition that if we wanna move from where we are today to a point out into the distant futures, it's not gonna be a straight line. It's gonna be more of a path that we kind of traverse. And, and as you get to the later chapters of the book, you realize it's something that we traverse together. And so you talk in the book then, in fact, in the title, the subtitle of the book, you talk about becoming great ancestors. What does that mean to become a great ancestor? 
Well, so you know, it's interesting. Daniel Gilbert at Harvard has came out with this, this 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 notion that we all kind of exist with this this fallacy, this end of history fallacy, where we tend to view ourselves, Ari and Lawrence, at the actual kind of in many ways, the end of history. We kind of see everything that happened before us is where the, all the action was, and we're somehow at the, at the tail end kind of dealing with the past. And I wanted to actually flip that. And that's also based on some neuroscience work done by Yaakov Trope at NYU, which is if we see ourselves at the very end of something, we actually to end up lacking agency, the ability to think about how we actually want to make either micro level change or systemic change. So by saying we need to become great ancestors. So in other words, flipping the script, if you will, that's why I went with becoming a great ancestor because we always see ourselves as descendants at that kind of tail end of something. And as a descendant, it seems like there's not much you can do. But if you flip it and see that actually we are the far future's great, great ancestors, if we want to be, then all of a sudden we start to see the locus of action, where the agency, where the change can happen, actually falls on us. Um, and so both being a great answer is, is kind of an, is an honor, but it's also a duty. It comes with a lot of challenges. It means we actually have to do something. We can't just kind of sit idly by and allow the future, this thing out there to kind of wash over us. It actually places us as almost the captains or the pioneers for the rest of the arc of human history moving forward, as opposed to just dealing with what came before us. When I was reading the book and I thought about the whole idea of being a great ancestor, it's almost like being an ancestor brings a certain set of accountability and, and responsibility with that terminology. So I, I like the framing of, of that. Um, let's talk about the concept of intertitles. Yeah. Uh, and then we'll get into some of the other specificity of the book. But I was intrigued by the use of the phrase intertidal. What, what are intertitles? Yeah, so I, I, so an intertidal, if, if we were, you know, an oceanographer, right, or someone who did, dealt with marine ecosystems, the technical idea of what an, an intertidal is, it's that zone on the edge of basically the beach. If everyone, anyone's ever been to the beach, you see the kind of the, the tide come in and out. So that whole zone that is sometimes above the water, sometimes below the water is what we call an intertidal zone. It's also therefore used as a metaphor in the book because it's very much where we are globally or even planetarily as, as a species, right? We, we know the old systems that we've been using for several hundred years, you know, in many ways tracing them back to the Renaissance, the, the industrial, you know, scientific method, the industrial revolution, first, second, and third waves of capitalism. Those old systems have worked very well, but up until now, up until a point, and if you kind of read anything, be it on the left or the right, we know these systems are breaking down. Our, our trust in all major institutions that came about over the past couple hundred years is at all time lows, be it, be it business or, or government or even religion. And so in this moment where the old system is kind of dying, if you will, and the new one is yet to be born, that's what an intertidal is. And the reason I talk about it, us being an intertidal is it's not all bad news. Right, an intertidal can be this kind of dangerous place, an interregnum, if you will. At the same time, when we look at intertidal zones in in the in the ocean sense, it's also a place of abundant creativity. There's ocean life that kind of knows how to navigate intertidal, both be in and out of the water, because it happens, you know, two times a day. And so I use the intertidal as a metaphor for us to kind of think about this moment that we're in isn't all chaos and flux, which is how it's talked about in magazines and, you know, on TV talk shows. It's also a time of really great opportunity and creativity to really start kind of designing systems that are bespoke for this moment, bespoke for this intertidal, that don't just let us kind of survive, actually allow us to set up what will probably be systems, ways of doing and thinking and, and really narratives that will carry through for the next several decades, if not several centuries. So it's really an amazing, it's a difficult time. Trust me, I know it's also an amazing time to be doing work, be it the work that, that folks in electricity are doing or anything in the kind of innovation space. And that's hardware innovation, that's software, that's even human systems innovation. We're kind of seeing an, an abundance of innovation flourishing in this intertidal that we're in, but it's important that we name it, that we know that we're in it. And because when, once we do that, it can actually kind of decrease 
the anxiety and the, the depression that people have and realize we're actually in a very unique moment where we can try lots of new different things and it's necessary. And to your point, it drives a sense of responsibility for the moment that we're in. Mm. So, so, so another thing coming again from the cover page of the book is or the cover of the book is the use of the phrase, the antidote to short termism. Uh, talk about how come our world today is dominated by short termism. How do we get here? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's interesting. Look, if Ari and Lawrence are walking in the you know Serengeti fifteen thousand years ago, and a, and a large tooth tiger jumps out behind a tree, you and I should not sit down and have a long conversation about what to do. We shouldn't have a strategic whiteboarding session. We should run right? The, the, and we should be very short-termistic in our thinking. So let's recognize that the, the hardware platform, to, to be a little too um, technical, but the hardware platform that is the central nervous system of humans actually requires short-termism to survive. It's what got us here through the past several hundred thousand years. The issue becomes is when it becomes kind of nested within larger incentive systems. So the most obvious ones obviously are kind of quarterly earnings or the political business election cycle where politicians start running for office the day after they're elected for the next election or when CEOs look at kind of management decisions and kind of how they should invest based on the stock price of their company that day. And that sounds kind of like a wild thing, but I have been in rooms where we've literally been planning out five, 10 year strategies for very large corporations all of a sudden, the stock price went down a little bit because there was a rumor and the CEO goes, you know what, we're actually not going to build that factory. I, I can't afford to do it based literally on what happened over the past couple of hours. And so that short termism and kind of the overarching systems that are in play that is pushing us. The reason I put that literally on the cover of the book, and this goes back to the previous question around the intertidal, is in intertidal moments, one of the first things to go is this idea of an official future. So we don't realize it, but we're all kind of operating with this idea of what tomorrow will be like. We need it to, to, to operate in such a way where we don't know what next week or next month or next year will kind of look like would be too cognitively taxing for us. So the official future is usually this unset, you know, uh, un, unsaid assumptions or narratives about how the world is going to work and how it's going to move forward. The issue with, a, with, a, with an official future is as it kind of consistently gets chopped at and broken away, people lose trust. When they lose trust in those overarching systems that set the official future agenda, they actually become, they really kind of move into a state where they're thinking less with the prefrontal cortex, less about kind of long-term executive functioning, and they fall back on what we call limbic level system, really the, the, the amygdala, what is sometimes referred to as a lizard brain, incorrectly, but that's what it's referred to. And so what long path is, is an applied mindset. It's a way of kind of navigating this intertidal that first and foremost pushes back on short-termism. Why short-termism is why short-termism is bad. What ends up happening is you become hyper-focused on the on the present moment. And yes, you will survive that tiger, but the reality is we're not in a situation where we're surrounded by large toothed tigers from 15,000 years ago. We're in a situation where we need leaders to step up and say, no, the other futures are possible. This is what they look like. And here's how we're going to get to them. And that's the, you know, long path itself is built on two, three pillars that we'll talk about in a second. But really what I, why we put an antidote to short-termism on the cover is because we want to acknowledge what people are going through and what it is they're going to get out of reading the book, but B, out of kind of implementing this mindset into their strategic thinking. So that, that's what short-termism is. And that's why we have to push back against it because in, in a, and I'll say this in a, in a non-political way, what ends up happening to populations in general when short-termism rises, and we've seen this over the past 2000 years, is people are looking, they get scared, anxiety goes up, and they're looking for instant answers. And where those instant answers tend to come from in a political sphere is through what we call strongmen or authoritarian thinking. So as we see the rise of that around the world to us at Long Path Labs, my organization, that's a very strong signal that we're in an intertidal, that folks are looking for quick fixes for the kind of anxious moment that we're in. 
Mm, that's interesting. And, and you know, the, the whole idea of official future is an interesting one because it, is, it begs the question in terms of who decides and who defines that future, that future in which you, you, you think you're headed towards. Um, but let me just go back to the book and the idea of sort of a multi-generational thinking here in terms of being a great ancestor or being a descendant. Uh, your parents had a big influence on your on your on your life. Talk a little bit about your dad and your mom and how their lives somehow impacted where you are today. Yeah, definitely. Um, you know, it's when most people talk about like, well, you know, who are you? Where are you from? You, you usually start. Well, I was born here in such and such year, and that's fine. But for me, it's slightly different because my story very much how I got to Long Path. My my major influences are my parents. And so we'll go back actually to my father because he was the older of the two. He was born in the middle 1920s in a you know, medium-sized town in Poland and being Jewish, very early on in the first weeks of the war, he lost part of his family just to, to the front, to the, to the Polish-German front. But then very quickly, the town that he was in, all the Jews were forced into a very small ghetto. And sparing you the graphic details, he lost most of his family in the concentration camps, but he eventually escaped the ghetto and became uh, basically an underground Jewish resistance fighter. So he fought with the Jewish partisans in the forest for, for several years. And then after the war was a, what we call a Nazi hunter. And then he made his way from Europe to Cuba and eventually to Mexico. Well, in Mexico, my mom was actually studying Mayan art and actually Mayan city planning. She was there because she was a student of the kind of famous engineer, futurist architect, someone who'd be very familiar to the folks on this webinar, Buckminster Fuller. And so Buckminster Fuller, as many of you know, was very much focused on the future as a futurist, but in many ways focused not on predicting the future, but on thinking about how do we design systems so that as many people can flourish on planet Earth as possible. One of his kind of famous quotes was, we have enough money and food to educate, house, clothe, and take care of every single person on the planet. Why don't we? Right? That was kind of his, his big kind of tumble level question. So growing up at the dinner table, we would often have conversations where my dad would talk about through, uh, through lived experience, all the things that can go wrong, how societies fall apart, right? In many ways, because he experienced that. On my mother's side of the table, she would talk about all the things that can go right, and all the things we have to do. So at any given point in, in a dinner conversation, we would kind of span over a hundred years. My dad would talk about the 1920s and sometimes even the early 1900s, my mom would talk about the 21 or 2200s, right? Because that's what happens when you, when you come up under Buckminster Fuller. So very early on, I was influenced, obviously, to think about this moment and the politics and the business of this moment, but to actually think in a way that stretched out. And you know, one of the things my dad would often say is, if you're, if you're worried or thinking about the future, you have, to become, you have to think about yesterday because the future started yesterday. And what that did was it very much changed my conception of time and how you make change happen, which is that you have to enter into any moment really recognizing what got you to that moment, as opposed to just assuming that where you are and everything behind you was somehow uh, sanitized and totally clean. And that's just like not the, that, that's not it at all. So that was very much an influence both on my thinking professionally, but in terms of long path, how I think about how we think about being great ancestors. I like what your dad said, the first part of that quote when he says, uh, if you forget the past, you don't have a future. I think that's a very, that very, very powerful statement. Uh, so let's get a little bit into Long Path. But before we do that, by the way, one quick question. Uh, in the insignia of Long Path, you have a dragonfly. Yeah, and I thought it was interesting. Why a dragonfly? So, it's, it, you know, it, it turns out, you know, we always have insignias or, or whatnot. And... The dragonfly is, you know, one of, one of the precepts of Long Path is that we always have to be able to kind of see omnidirectional, right? We can't just be looking forward. We can't just be looking backwards. We, we have to be looking left, right, up, and down, kind of all at the same time, and be very kind of honest with ourselves with where we are as individuals, as leaders, as organizations, as companies, as societies, as nations, right? And so there's actually, there's actually only one animal that actually does this on planet Earth. It's the dragonfly, right? 
Hundreds, thousands of eyes actually allow it to see in any given direction at any given time. That's why the dragonfly is an amazing predator, but it's also very difficult to catch because it's actually, even though it may look like it's facing forward, it actually has this almost 360 degree view about what's happening around it. And so kind of a tenet of long path is to always be aware and able to think about what might come next. But to my earlier point, what happened before and what's happening all around you, being very kind of conscious of the current moment and how you got there. And so I couldn't think of anything better kind of to, to, to kind of, uh, put that in our mind's eye than, than a dragonfly. So the, it's an astute observation by you. The dragonfly kind of is our, our spirit animal when we kind of think about how we should think and operate in this world. Well, this is great because, you know, one of the actual listeners to this uh, conversation right now is a famous biomimicrist, uh, Michaela Inch, who was actually on this uh, on the show a couple of uh, months ago and talk about biomimicry. And so I thought it was very intriguing to have a conversation about this and then bringing the whole role of the of the dragonfly. Okay, so let's, let's, let's one, one other example before you talk about the pillars of long path. And in the book, you, you talk about the sort of a, you give an example where you talk about the analog clock and a digital clock. And in that, in that example, you try to make the point about how, how uh, we need to focus on the present but sometimes we also need to take the big picture view. Talk about that clock analogy between the digital and the and the uh, the analog. Yeah. So most of you right now are probably watching this on your computer. So if you look in your upper right or upper left hand corner, you're going to see a digital clock. It's going to say 11:23 a.m. That's great. You need to know what time it is. But as we've moved into a more kind of digital way of thinking about time and where we are in the world, one of the things we lost was what the analog clock gave us. So in your office, you'll, you'll look around, maybe you have one, maybe you don't, you'll see an actual analog clock with hands on it. So what's the difference? When you look at a digital clock, you're very much in the present moment. There's really, there's really no future, there's really no past, it's just the now. And I don't mean the now, in the Buddhist sense of being present. I mean, literally in the fact that we don't think about time any, any differently in many ways, right? We just, it's very much, we're very much stuck in what we, what Doug Rushkoff calls presentism, which becomes this ahistorical sense where you're disconnected temporally. Now, when you look at an analog clock, yes, it may say 1124 with the hands, but what you also see is the entire day stretched out. You see all the numbers. You have a kind of idea of what we call temporalness, right? You have an idea in a sense that there was something that came before 1124. There's something that'll come after 1124. And it seems almost like a trite example, but you really kind of have to step back and think as a society, we're so in this moment, right? We're so very much not connected to larger scales of time that even something like the clock, a, a very kind of small thing in our upper screen of, of our computer is just another kind of metaphor, or I was gonna say analog, to how much we've disconnected ourselves from the big picture, the big kind of span uh, of, of time that we're actually in. And so when we think about an antidote to short-termism, one part of that antidote is stepping back and, and thinking much bigger. And often people say, oh, you have to take the 30,000 view, foot view and think higher. I'm arguing that you need to do that, but you need to take a, almost like a 30,000 year view. And it doesn't mean we go into the future 30,000 years or even 15,000 years, but we have to recognize how so many things just in our environment kind of have us stuck in a, in a non, in a non, um, temporal sense of, of nature. Because once we get stuck in that moment, we lack that agency to actually make those major changes that we need to make. Interesting. So let's let's talk now about the pillars of long path. And there are a couple of questions coming in, so I encourage the audience to keep submitting your questions. We'll get to them shortly. But uh, Ari, talk about the two critical pillars of long path and try to sort of make it more out of a practical for, for the listener, can you just describe what those pillars are and how, how they could be sort of understood and applied? Sure, so, so let, let's go in kind of theoretically what they are first. They're, they're very simple. So I, I talked about long path as a mindset. And it's, look, when you pick up the book, you'll notice it's not, it's not the longest book. I didn't wanna write something that went on and on and on. I want you to kind of get in, get the idea and then start applying it immediately in your own life, be it as a, as a parent or as a colleague or in the workplace or as a politician. 
And we, by the way, we've gotten feedback from all those different categories. It's been amazing because people are kind of integrating it immediately into their own sphere of influence. So the first kind of pillar, and we've already touched on this, is moving away from thinking about the future as a singular kind of object or a noun. And, and Lawrence, you picked up on this earlier, this idea of the official future. One of the things that it does is it narrows the scope of what is possible, right? So when you only have a singular future, there's basically, you, you have no agency. You're basically thinking, what do I have to do? How do I position myself or my company or my family to operate within the confines of that official singular future? The singular future that we're in right now that Lawrence, you got at earlier, is one kind of very much defined by technology. Now, I'm not saying technology is important. I'm not saying it has an impact. But what ends up happening is when we think about how we evolve as leaders or how we evolve as parents or even how we evolve as society or civilization, it always happens within that singular cone of the official singular future. Um, and, and to your earlier point, Lawrence, Oftentimes, that official future is kind of written out by someone. And right now, if we look at any conversation about what is progress or the future, it's through this kind of techno-solutionistic lens. It totally makes sense, but it actually becomes limiting. And so the first pillar of Long Path is to move from future thinking, the singular, to futures thinking, the plural with an S. It's a sm small little addition. It's just an S. But what that does is it widens the cone of possibilities. So it allows us to start thinking about not how do we make decisions within the small kind of cone of the official singular future, but to a much wider one of multiple futures. And what that does is it brings agency back into individuals to start asking questions about, well, what is what could our company look like? How could we evolve as an organization or as a society or as a parent or even as an individual outside of the singular future? Uh, one of the things I've stopped doing is I get I get asked to kind of speak or be on panels all the time, and they're like, "We want you to speak on this panel, the future of transportation." <laughs> and I always say, "Look, I'm not going to go on your I'm not going to go on your future of transportation panel. I will go on your futures of transportation panel, right? Because then it starts to kind of very much open it up, and I'll and I'll and I'll come back to a real world example of what that looks like in a second. So the second pillar of Long Path, it's really second or third, depending on how you read the book. Is, 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 is really two things. One is what we call transgenerational empathy. It's a, it's a mouthful. And what transgenerational empathy is, it is thinking about yourself, not as a singular kind of individual with a singular, what I call a lifespan bias. So Ari's birth to Ari's death. But when you think about transgenerational empathy, you realize that we're not living through a hundred yard dash that is between my birth and my death but it's actually something much bigger and much more overlapping. Because what it does is it puts you from being a singular kind of link to seeing you as a link in a much larger chain going backwards and going forwards. And the reason I talk about transgenerational empathy as opposed to transgenerational thinking, which is cognitive, is all the research that we did at Long Path Labs with all of our board of advisors and our scientists and our neuroscientists led us to a conclusion that what actually circumscribes how people think about the futures, what ideas they can have, what are the new kind of innovations and ways of being, what actually constrains that more often than not is the voices in their head. And I don't mean this to make light of it, but when I say voice, I mean kind of the societal pressures, the parental pressures, the, the corporate pressures, the curriculum at business schools even, basically say, this is the way you do things and you either do it this way, it's either right or wrong. What empathy allows us to do is instead of kind of fighting against the past and saying, oh, those business schools were wrong, my parents were wrong, the previous CEO was wrong, was to recognize that more often than not, those that came before us were doing the best they could with the information they had at that point in time. And so what empathy allows you to do for those who came before is, and this is a little bit of a sleight of hand, and you'll see this in the book, is it allows you to have empathy for yourself right now. Because once you actually start to have kind of gratitude for those who came before you, and this doesn't mean you let people off the hook that came before you, uh, far be it from that, but to understand that they operated in their own kind of societal context and that circumscribed their options, it lets you start to actually see things in a much more um, open and honest way. So remember, before I was doing Long Path, I was running and building innovation labs 
for very large organizations. And more often than not, I found when we brought people into a room to think about possible futures, they always had these roadblocks and we couldn't figure out what those kind of roadblocks or bottlenecks were. And we realized it was, they were always kind of carrying the, the baggage, the good and the bad from the past, wherever they worked, what they were told, what they were told would and wouldn't work into the room with them. And we wanted to find a way to kind of clear that out. So having that empathy and the gratitude for those who came before, and then thinking about what are the positive and not positive things from those who came before that you want to bring with you now into your decision-making kind of process, that is the empathy for the current moment. And then of course, empathy for the future is what allows you to make the behaviors and the changes and decisions that will really impact the far futures. Again, why empathy? Because we're talking about emotion. What all the research has shown, Lawrence, is if I sit back and I say, okay, here's what we want you know, electrical power to look like over the next 150 years in America, and we plot it out as a PowerPoint, people say, oh, that's really, you know, those are great ideas, those are great visions, but very quickly, life will hit them, and they'll say, oh, we, we, kind of like the CEO that I was talking about earlier, the stock price will go down, something will happen, and they'll kind of forget that, and they'll go back to kind of short-term thinking and acting and strategy. When you ask people to be kind of empathetic and connect emotionally to future generations, you move away from the intellectual, you become much more kind of emotionally connected. Why is that important? All the research shows that when you have an empathic emotional connection to others, specifically far future generations, you are more likely to take the actions necessary because instead of saying, well, we want, let's say, um, electrical grid systems that look like this in a hundred years. If you, if you put it that way, that's kind of the classic, the future of. But when you actually reframe the question to be, how do we want people to live in a hundred years from now? How do we want them to flourish? How do we want them to feel? Believe it or not, all the research shows that we start asking that question, how do we want our descendants to feel? And then you start kind of backcasting into the more formal things that have to happen for them to feel that way, you become much more resilient. It's their ultimate aim or ultimate vision. It comes from the Greek word. Interesting, because I like what you just said in terms of empathy for the past, the present, and the future. And what I'm thinking about you, Ari, is you have kids, I have kids. But imagine if the conversation would be, I'm saving for my great, great, great grandkids, where we all plan for our kids and our grandkids. But the notion that I'm, I'm, I'm investing in this particular stock for my great, 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 great grandchildren, we haven't stretched our imagination that far. And I think from a practical standpoint, that's where we want to go. Uh, let's take one question. There's a question here. I think it's from, uh, from, uh, from, uh, 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 from Switzerland, actually. Uh, can you correlate the inclination of a society to be short or long-term uh, oriented with the level of development or political stability. You kind of alluded to it a little bit here, but I think trying to understand what's the correlation between short-term thinking, long-term thinking, and the economic development in the country. Do you see any correlation there? 100%. Um, so look, when you, don't do this now because you'll leave the webinar. When, <laughs> when, you, when you look at the list of the oldest companies on the planet that are over, companies that are over a thousand years old, 90% of those companies exist in Japan and some of them in Europe. But when we look at when those companies were formed, it was more often than not during a very kind of stable, steady state uh, political economy, either in Japan or in parts of Europe or even in parts of South America. So in many ways, the ability to think long-term is connected to that political stability. But that's, there's actually a layer deeper than that, which I think you're kind of, with, with that, what I think you're getting at, which is this idea of, of a stronger culture towards thinking about those future generations as opposed to a, a winner-take-all culture, right? And so one of the things that I get at in the book is in this kind of advanced hyper-capitalism moment that we're in, which is one very much of, I'm gonna get everything that I can right now. It's kind of like the story you know, uh, of the ant and the cricket who's just gonna play right now. And the other one is kind of storing seeds for the winter. In this moment, those that are more willing to invest in the far futures are more often than not going to have a more steady cultural state. 
and be in a state of mind that allows them to think differently and critically and, and with more responsibility and, and, a, and a word I'll use with more honor towards a, a larger kind of vision of what they're involved in. And so listen, it, it's difficult in, in growing economies, for sure, people, especially who are moving from you know, abject poverty into the middle class, tend to be more, let's say, consumer consumption, luxury brand oriented, less, less long-term in their, in their thinking. So part of it becomes, how do we incentivize that type of thinking, even in countries that are developing and moving into kind of higher levels of middle class? Very much kind of the work that we're invested in at Long Path Labs is thinking about how do you do that without kind of coming from up high and saying, no, 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 you don't, you don't need that level of living. You don't need that level of luxury. Let us tell you why, even though we already went through it. It's a big conundrum, which is why so much of what Long Path talks about in the book and in the work that we do as coming at this from an almost psychosocial cultural standpoint, as opposed to kind of an external validation standpoint. Mm. Great question. We live in a very you know, I wouldn't say turbulent time, but we live in a turbulent time in the sense that a lot of things happening in the world that we, we did not expect, we didn't want to happen. We've had a pandemic and we're still going through some phases of it. We have the, the war in Ukraine, but we have geopolitical issues and all of these issues of the world and we have the economic issue as well. Um, you know, let's talk about societal sort of a long-term thinking. In, in the book, you, you talk about, you know, the Iroquois Confederacy, for example, as one example of one sort of a society that was able to apply long-term thinking. You have similar thought processes happening in, say, for example, in New Zealand. Uh, you have it in parts of Canada with the, uh, you know, the, uh, you know the, how, they, how they deal with some of their past. How do we sort of uh, normalize or make accepted the notion of long-term thinking. How do we integrate that into our current uh, social systems, our current educational systems? And, and how critical is it for us to do that as soon as possible, given the challenges we're facing? So it is, so I'll start with the last part of your question. It's incredibly important, right? The, the way we will make it through this moment, because one of, one of two things can happen in this intertitle, right? We're not, and I'm not, a, I'm not doing this to scaremonger, but this can go one in a couple of ways, this intertidal. We can become kind of more fear-based, more short-term in our thinking, more kind of populist in our action, negative populism, if you will. And what that'll end up doing is, I think, setting us back not only decades, but potentially centuries as a, as a, as a species on planet Earth, especially when it comes to climate change. Now, the other kind of side of the equation, Lawrence, that you got at, is long path is not new thinking, right? When we look at kind of First Nations or indigenous cultures, be it from Australia or Canada, where I happen to be today, America, New Zealand, uh, South America, this way of thinking was not only kind of an aspect, but it was actually a core principle of many of these communities, of many of these nations. Um, so when I did the research for Long Path, and I say this many times throughout the book, this isn't original. I've taken kind of the neuroscience and some of the kind of more westernized ways of how we approach problems and meshing it with this larger kind of uh, wisdom tradition and wisdom narratives about what does it mean to be a great ancestor, right? There's a reason I use that language. There, there's other books that talk about long-termism, and they're, they're much more kind of technical and scientific, and they're worried about let's say artificial intelligence, really important things. But I think before we get to the point where we can actually worry about those things, we have to have at a, at a almost at a psychological, emotional level as individuals and as organizations, an understanding of our role in what I call the much larger project of homo sapien flourishing. Now that sounds very scientific and very Western. Th that's, that's where I come from. But in conversations with, with indigenous elders, they'll use the same thinking, the same narrative, but it's something that goes back thousands of years because they recognize that if they overfished or let's say even overpopulated certain regions and didn't see themselves in balance or in harmony or acting in a regenerative way where they put more in and the systems are allowed to kind of regrow themselves, they would actually cease to exist. We don't have that mentality here anymore, especially in the West, where, you know, when I, I say this in the book, and again, I eat meat, right? But like, if I go to the grocery store, I'll get a piece of meat. It's like saran wrapped. It's perfect. I don't think about where it came from, how it was grown. I'm very disassociated from it. 
what, you know, in indigenous cultures, if you're especially going back several hundred years, several thousand years, you're hunting, you're fishing, you see where it comes from and you recognize the fish you just pulled out of the river is coming from that river. So you're not going to pollute that river. But we've gotten to the point where we're so disconnected in kind of advanced capitalism. Not that I'm knocking it, I'm, I, I live in that system that that disassociation is in many ways what Long Path is actually trying to tackle. Mm. So, I, you know, I see Long Path also, uh, Ari, as sort of a, another approach to understanding sustainable development and sustainability and, and dealing with some of the global challenges we're facing. And so if you want to be more practical then, um, you know, when, when and how do we start to apply Long Path thinking? Uh, do we wait until we get into college uh, when we become a corporate executive? Or is this something you can start to apply to your teenager, or even to your, you know, to your seven, eight, nine year old? When do we start to integrate this approach to decision making so that even as a child, I'm thinking about the long term consequences of my actions. And so I bring this up because I want you to also reflect on the current political systems in the world where we see a lot of short termism driving decisions that should actually be viewed from the long term. So first aspect of the question, when do we start nurturing the idea of long-term thinking and the long path approach? And what do we do with the situation in which we exist today to sort of a really try to get rid of this long short termism that is driving a lot of the politics and the decision making today? Yeah, I mean, the, the, great questions. Um, there was a very famous experiment done in the 80s by uh, Professor Michelle at Columbia University called the Marshmallow Test. Many of you may be familiar with it, where and there, there's been, there's some errors with it. Well, I, I'll recognize that. There's, you know, the kids that were brought in came from kind of privileged backgrounds. But that being said, these, these very young, you know, third and fourth graders were brought into a room and they were told, you know, there was a marshmallow placed in front of them. And they said, if I come back in 10 minutes and that marshmallow is still here, you'll get two marshmallows. Well, you know what happened? Like 90% of the kids ate that first marshmallow. Now, the other percentage, 10% roughly, who didn't eat the marshmallow, they were tracked over time. And you know what, you know where the story goes, what the data shows. Those that were able to delay gratification ended up having higher test scores, higher kind of life expectancy, kind of a better way uh, from an empirical sense of kind of life that they live, those that were able to do that. Part of Long Path is actually delayed gratification and not saying, I want everything now. Now, it doesn't necessarily mean you have to sacrifice in the present for the future, but it does mean you have to kind of downshift in many ways what your expectations are in a very much a me, a me now, me centric right now culture that we live in, right? There's something really nice about ordering something online and getting it four hours later, but is that the best thing you can do for the future? If you think about kind of what goes into getting to something to you in four hours, again, I'm not knocking that. I'm saying these are decisions and questions we have to ask. So as you mentioned, I, I have young children. I have 13-year-old twin daughters and a nine-year-old boy. And so I've been talking about long path with, with them for years. And one of the one of the things that we've done very early on, and, it, and it's in the book, and I see both of my, all three of my children do this now. And if, and if you have children, I would say you should think about how to actually integrate is I talk about the difference between, you know, present you and future you. And so there was this great work done by Hal Hirschfield at UCLA, where he put a bunch of people, uh, freshmen actually, into an fMRI machine, a, a functional magnetic resonance machine, where you can actually see activation and oxygen flow in the brain. And he had them go into an fMRI machine and he said, okay, I want you to think about yourself right now. And, you know, one part of the brain lit up. And then he said, okay, I want you to think about Matt Damon with the assumption they didn't personally know him, but they knew about him. And so this is the part that lit up for when they thought about themselves right now. This is the part that lit up when they thought about Matt Damon. Then Hal asked them a sec another question, which is, think, I want you to think about yourself 10 years from now, your future you. And you know what happened. The part that lit up for Matt Damon is the same part that lit up for them 10 years ago. It was this entity out there that they kind of had a vague connection with. So he pulls them out of the machine and he breaks the groups into two parts. One, a control group. The other group, he has them do two interventions. <clears throat> one is he has them look at a photo of themselves aged 10 years from now. And they look at it every day for 30 days. He also has them write letters to their future selves. 
And what he found was when he put him back into the machine 30 days later, you know what happened? The group that hadn't had any of the intervention still had that big disconnection from their future self. But the group that had written letters to their future selves or seen photos of themselves aged now had almost total overlap between in their brain and the parts of the brain that thought about their current self and their future self. What that means is they now were able to start making decisions that would benefit their future self. And so when you're working with young folks, like I do uh, at Long Path, where we're in schools and I actually have my own kids, if you ask them to start thinking about their future self and create more of that alignment. So if you go to longpath.org, there's a little thing on the top navigation bar that says future me. Now we can't read those, but what it allows you to do is send a letter to your future self. You know, if the default is five years, but it could be 10 years and it's stored on servers in Australia and we can't read it. But it turns out that it's not, the science shows, it's not about receiving the letter, it's about actually writing the letter. So yes, some of the stuff in Long Path is, is pretty complex for folks that are kind of older, but even writing a letter to your future self starts to have more of that increased alignment. And it's unbelievably important in terms of both job, obviously delayed gratification, but in terms of kind of taking agency and responsibility over your own actions and how they will benefit or not benefit your future you or future generations. So the, the Lawrence, the main point in that is a couple of days ago, I was getting ready to take ice cream out. I took ice cream out of our freezer. You know, I, I did a scoop and I was getting ready to do a second scoop for myself. And my nine-year-old son goes, is that what your future self wants? And, <laughs> and I didn't take the second scoop. So I know it's working at least in the Wallach household. And again, it's not all about just ice cream and how you look in the mirror, but that's sometimes where things have to start before we can go to these much bigger things. Yeah, no, it's interesting you mentioned that. So by the way, uh, you have uh, 12 year old twin daughters, you said, Th right? Now 13 year old twin daughters. 13 year old twin daughters, well, I have seven year old twin boys. Okay. Uh, so well, we, need to, you know. we need to trade, uh, trade experiences here and share some ideas with each other. Uh, we got about, you know, 10, 12 minutes left. Just one quick response to a question again from Michaela Emch, uh, who's dialing in from, uh, from, from Switzerland and a very good friend of mine when it comes to biomimicry. But her question is, moving away from a me now centric gratification necessitates trusting into the future or trusting the future that you envision. How does one do that? How, how does one trust a future that hasn't come yet? I mean, look, that it's a, it's a, it's an interesting question because the, the future that hasn't come yet is actually the one that we're building. Yes. So, so what, so it actually, the, the trust is really on yourself, mm -hmm. right? The, the, and Lawrence, you, we just alluded to this. One of the things about long path, the mindset is like I said earlier, you know, I have they're, they're friends of mine who are reading it in the white house in all sorts of organizations in Washington, DC in the intelligence community. But where it's also being read is in all these kind of parenting groups. They keep kind of reaching out to me and saying, oh, I'm using this in, the, in, in, in my parenting style. And what I realized, and you realize this as an author after the book comes out and it kind of goes into the world and you always these kind of unintended audiences pick it up, is that very much how Ari or Lawrence or any of your listeners, how we interact with those around, especially of the next generation. It doesn't have to be your own kids, right? It can be nieces, nephews. You can volunteer at schools or libraries if you don't have children or you don't want to have children. But what happens when you interact and you model a way of being? So Long Path isn't necessarily about big whiteboard experiments and saying, oh, we're going to set up, a, you know, one of my pet projects is like a global energy grid. I've been pushing that for a long time. It's like an internet with ultra high voltage DC cables, something we can talk about another time. That's very long path. What's also very long path is how you interact with your child in the morning. Because what ends up happening is that reverberates out into the future, especially if they're going to have children. So case in point, and going back to Mikhail's, you know, really smart question, an insightful question is I, I was in a conversation uh, with my son after he had done something that was, let's just say, less than perfect. And I wasn't being my best self. And I was kind of really kind of being, laying into him, being kind of giving him a guilt trip. And, and my, my wife, of course, always my wife, looks at me and she just says under her breath, long past. And I knew what that cue was. What that cue was, was a recognition and a remembrance that how I'm interacting with my son at this point isn't just about me and him, 
but it's actually modeling a set of behaviors that will then he will then use with his children, which then will be used by his grandchildren. So in this very moment, how I interact with, with those listening, how I interact with you, Lawrence, how we interact with our kids, sets up a trim tab, ongoing reverberation. And I don't mean this in the new age sense. I mean this in the sense of complexity and chaos theory of how those futures will actually exist. So if you wanted to have more trust in those futures, you have to have more trust and responsibility and empathy in the present because you are literally laying the groundwork for those futures to come in all of your interactions, in all of your decisions. It's really intense to know that how you interact with your children could reverberate out thousands of years, but that's the reality. That's the world that we're in right now. That is actually how cultural transmission happens by those moment by moment interactions. It's fascinating. And we have about 10 more minutes, uh, Ari, and I'm gonna try to get in at least three or four more questions. But one of the things I really liked about the book are there, the examples you have and the exercises that the reader has to do as, as they go through reading the book. Uh, let's, let's talk about uh, climate change. We, we have COP27 taking place in Egypt, and I'm creating a scenario where Ari Wallach is sitting in a room with all the world leaders who will be going to, going to Egypt. They're in Egypt now. Uh, let's create that future. So we're in Egypt, and you're sitting there in that room with the world leaders, and you're about to give them a one-minute explanation of why they need to apply long path approaches to the decision making, why it's critical. You got one minute and you're in that room with those world leaders talking about climate change and what needs to be done. Uh, what would you tell them and how can they apply the lessons in the book? So, so it's, a great, it's a great question. So, so my wife is a social worker and she always says, you have to meet the client or the patient or your population where they are. So if I'm in the room with world leaders, not to make light of world leaders, we have to recognize that what they see them and where they see themselves is as kind of very important people who want to think about their legacy. So in my one minute, I wouldn't necessarily, I wouldn't say, hey, you need to, you know, think long path, generations to come, here's why it's important. What I would say is, this is about your legacy. This is about how future generations remember what you did or did not do. So a thousand years from now, when they look back, you know, COP is in November 20. What is that? Yes. Ancestors from a thousand years ago about what they did and didn't do. They will look back on you. And the questions they will ask is, why didn't they do this or why did they do that? And I would very much frame it for them in a sense of legacy and tribute in terms of how they will be looked back upon in terms of their legacy. That's how I would do it with, with, with world leaders. It's how Actually, how I do do it with world leaders or with CEOs often is I talk about legacy because your legacy isn't your name on the side of a building or a statue. It really comes down to your decisions. Did you do the right thing? Were you on the right side of history? And it's not about the present. It's about how you will be remembered in the history books. And I find more often than not, when I kind of frame it like that for leaders at the top, be it the UN or Fortune 100 companies or Fortune 10 companies, they're more likely to take the actions necessary to allow there to be flourishing over the next several generations, if not the next several thousand years. So we've moved now from the world leaders and we're going to come now to the average consumer like myself and others, very lay people. And you have an opportunity in a town hall meeting with a, a group of, of folks who are going to be making very important decisions in America and other parts of the world in a democratic process where they're going to say cast a vote uh, in, in case of an election. What do you tell them? How do they apply long term thinking when they're about to cast their, uh, their vote in a democratic society, for example? So there's this great uh, process that they use in Japan by a professor at the University of Tokyo called it's called future design. It's, it's not the best term, but it's a good term. And one of the things that he does is when he brings people, when he, he brings kind of uh, local population citizenry together to think about town budgets or things that are very much of the moment that they have to decide on, he actually will have, he will randomly choose, let's say 10% of the people in the room to be emissaries from the future. And what he does is he gives them these very cool ornate golden robes and they are there to represent the future generations. It could be 2040 or 2060. 
and they act as proxies for whatever is being talked about in the room. So people will say, okay, do we vote on this four lane highway or not? Or do we build this building or not? And normally people kind of think about it from the present moment going forward. But then there are those in the room who are supposed to kind of look back and say, well, here's why that did or didn't work for us in 2040, 2060. So if I had my druthers, I would have people do that in the room. But when it doesn't happen and you're just in there and no one's wearing the golden robes, you have to step back and say, as you're thinking about these decisions, you have to do a, a cognitive empathic shift and say, okay, I'm going to internally put on that golden road for the next five minutes while I'm weighing this decision and really think about what is it, again, I deal at an emotional level, what is it about this decision that did or didn't work? Now, none of us can predict the future, so it's very difficult to go out to 2050 and look backwards, but what it does allow us to do is when we place ourselves in the future, looking backwards, it allows us to have a conversation with those making the decision and to kind of put it into a much larger context. Again, it's very much what we talked about earlier in terms of the future you decision-making, but it really comes down to future us and what is it that we needed. Okay, so now let's move into another environment to wrap things up, I have two more questions. This environment is an environment with corporate executives. You have the energy systems going through a lot of transformation. We have a situation in Europe with the energy crisis. We have a situation in other parts of the world. And business executives are having to make hard choices between the now and the future. Uh, what do you tell them? How could Long Path have an impact, say, on how they're viewed as a business in terms of the decisions they're making? How do they apply Long, long Path concepts to their decision making in this current environment? So it's interesting. I, I'm, I'm here in Montreal right now. I'm giving a talk to 50 leading CEOs in the Quebec region tonight. This is what we're going to talk about. And it's interesting. I asked them ahead of time, what are you most concerned about when it comes to the future? And they say climate change and artificial intelligence and retaining and attracting the workers of today and tomorrow, like Gen Z, millennials. And so it's a perfect way to kind of go into this question, because what we have found and others have found is the old ways of bringing workforces and inspiring them just with kind of perks, be it dollars or candy machines or ping pong tables, isn't working anymore. When you step back and look at Gen Z and millennials and say, what's the most important thing for you in terms of where you work? They're gonna say, it wherever I am, whatever we're doing is connected to a larger purpose, a larger sense of meaning, not just sustainability. That doesn't work anymore. It's not just about organic. It's about something much, much bigger. And so what I would say, what I will say partially tonight in my, in my remarks, is if you want to attract and retain the workers of today and tomorrow, you have to connect to something larger than just your quarterly returns. People are thinking about inequality. They're thinking about climate change. They're thinking about what is the world going to look like for themselves and their children, their grandchildren. So if you wanna be a CEO that is truly leading into the 21st and 22nd century, you need to be not only doing this work for the, for the far futures, you need to be public about it. You need to talk about it. And you need to say, this is why we're doing this. And by the way, our quarterly numbers, by the way, quarterly reporting is totally made up. It was, it's not something you have to do. Many companies no longer do it. So literally voicing and saying, we are now in the business of ensuring flourishing futures for generations to come that allows you to make those decisions. It allows you to actually attract and entertain the best employees. Now, the obvious thing is, here in America, Wall Street may not look and like that. We have to get to a point where kind of long pathian thinking, this kind of culture of taking care of future generations becomes embedded and incentivized. And we're going to run out of time, but that's literally the work that we are doing now as an organization is thinking about how we get to that point. The way we get to that point is incentivizing people much from from a perspective of almost a, a spiritual or empathic way of connecting to the future, as opposed to purely a material way of thinking about the future. Well, Larry, my last question, and this is one that I think you can easily hit, hit, home, hit a home run quickly on, and that is we've now talked about different groups. We've addressed the CEOs, we've addressed world leaders. Uh, let's Now let's close this conversation on the me, the person listening and who is gonna yep. listen to this afterwards. How do I go about assessing during the day that I'm ultimately going to be a great ancestor. How do I do that throughout my daily living and just in life in general, whether you're in Africa, Latin America, Asia, wherever you are in the world, listen to this podcast or listen to this, in this conversation. How does this individual then go about assessing if they're doing the right things to be a great ancestor? 
look, first and foremost, let's recognize one, it's a difficult thing to do at first. Two, there are a lot of people on this planet living literally hour to hour because of where they are in a socioeconomic system that we have set up on this planet. So it's, it's a privilege to even be able to have a conversation to think about or to be in a place to think about how can I be a great ancestor? Because that means that some of your basic needs are already met. So first and foremost, we have to recognize that. Secondly, it really comes down to thinking and stepping back and saying where I very much started, there's this official future of what success looks like. But if you step back and say, what are the most important values to me? What is a way of thinking about how I want to be remembered, right? I call this third paragraph thinking, which means the third paragraph in your obituary. The first paragraph is, you know, your name, where you were born, how you died. The second one is who you left behind. The third paragraph in your obituary was what were the values and the most important things that you did? And if whatever you're working on or whatever you're doing can't make it into that third paragraph, you need to step back and reassess and think about what am I doing that is ensuring flourishing for my future self, for future generations, those closest to me, and the future generations to come. And it's not always going to be, I'm not always perfect, right? I flew to Montreal. I could have taken the train. It would have taken me 47 hours. I could have done it. This is not about being, you know, it's not a purity test, but it's about making those incremental changes and shifting the way you think. So even when you're going to grab those disposable razors off the, you know, drugstore shelves thinking, okay, is there another way of doing this than the way I'm going to do this in a kind of instant throwaway culture? Is this how future generations, if they had a little camera on me and saw what I was grabbing and doing and consuming or how I was talking to other people and laying those kind of future foundations, would they be proud of what I was doing or not? It sounds like a lot. It sounds very heavy, but I can tell you, because I've been doing it for a while, those around me, those in my organization, the people that we train are doing it. It starts to allow you to make small adjustments in how you talk to other people, how you consume, and how you make decisions. So just start doing that small practice at the individual level. You see, we'll start to reverberate out through all of your decision making. That's that's how you start it. You have to start building the future from the inside out. Mm. I think I'll end on that note because re referencing both Minister Fuller's uh, experiment or his invention on the trim tab, I think we all need to have little trim trim tabs in our lives 100%. as we go along, uh, applying this. Listen, Ari. Fantastic book, Long Path. Uh, congratulations on the book. Good luck Thank to you. Montreal. And again, I'll give you a call to talk about the tips for how you get your yes, please. Girl and twin boys to get involved in, in Long Path thinking. So thanks and congratulations. And I'll see you Thank when you. I come to New York. Thank you for having me. Thanks. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.